good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you may be in this wonderful world. And as you can see, it's a beautiful morning. So I thought we should come out, take a ride through some gorgeous scenery and see what photos we can find by the side of the road. Now I have already ridden from my home put this over here so it can't land on the floor. I've already ridden from my home out here into Dorset. We are just near Wimborne, slightly north of Poole, and I'm intending to head north through this area here. It is a really scenic, beautiful area. I know there's going to be some pictures by the side of the road on a day like today, so I'm just going to enjoy a nice warm cup of coffee and let's boogie. Something to always bear in mind if you're riding around looking for some pictures, go slow. Just take your time and look around because over there we've got a gorgeous building. I'm just wondering, can I find a place to stop and shoot it? Now I don't think it's going to be a particularly exciting photograph because of the light. You may remember an earlier photo biker video we did. Can I see it from this gateway? Not really. Let's just see what's further up the road. An earlier photo biker video that we did out on the Cranbourne Chase near Shaftesbury, where we got this shot. And it was awesome because it was a cloudy day and we got some light coming down through the clouds and it highlighted the house in the valley and the little tree on the hilltop. Now today we don't have that. We've got a clear blue sky. Blue skies are lovely but they're not as exciting for the photography side of things as having a bit of cloud, having a bit of texture, a bit of something going on up there. Let's have a look. I want to take that picture because I want to show you. I just got to find somewhere I can stop. I mean, look over there. It's just the most beautiful scenery, isn't it? And I mean, what a privilege to be riding a bike through it it's absolutely marvelous but you've got to be mindful you've got to be present you've got to be aware of your surroundings there it is down there now can i get at it from here because that's a much better angle you know what now i've climbed down here amongst the brambles i'm beginning to change my opinion i actually think it's going to work quite well although it's a different type of shot to the one we got up on the chase let's do it so in the GoPro, you are probably struggling to see it. It's somewhere in this sort of area here. And it's very, very small because the GoPro has got a very, very wide angle lens. So long lens on. Let's look through my camera. Here we go. Just putting the house right in the middle of the frame. Well, that's not terribly exciting, is it? So as we extend that focal length, we're obviously zooming in because longer lenses make far off things come closer. Of course, it's still not quite sharp, is it? Can I manually change that while I'm filming? Yeah, that's better. Composition, where will we put it? Well, I'd put it down low like that, right low in the frame. Now you may have heard of things like the rule of thirds. So that's placing it on a third. That's placing it on a third. I don't think it's as exciting. I would put it just down low in the frame like that. Have some of that gray sky. Might even back that zoom off just a little bit. I don't really want this in the corner though, so I might have to zoom it back in. There we go. Now, one of the things you always have to remember when you're taking pictures is, of course, to look all the way around the viewfinder, the whole thing. Don't just look at the subject, look at the whole picture. 
exposure and stuff, well, I think with evaluative metering, evaluative metering, matrix metering, whatever you call it, the camera's gonna get it pretty much right. So let's have a look through and just set the exposure that the camera wants. For some reason, I'm having all sorts of problems with this today, and I don't really know quite why. Right, let's get the house focused up. There it is. I'm gonna set the exposure the camera wants, and we're gonna go with a two thousandth of a second. It is bright at f14, 200 ISO. Recreate that, ex that composition we were looking at with the house fairly low in the frame, and have a look. You know what? I actually think that is better than I thought it was going to be. You see, if you don't go, you don't know. It's always worth stopping and trying something because that is quite a nice shot. It's a different shot to the one we got on the chase. That would be awesome if we had a shaft of sunlight. We haven't, but it is still kind of working. Even though the sun is sort of coming from behind, something to remember with light is that at this time of year, the winter, certainly at our latitude, the sun is low in the sky. It's only, if I point my arm straight at it, it's, it's only at that angle. And that always helps. This is a good time of year for this type of photography. Let's rock and roll. Let's go find some more. pretty isn't it just looking through there at that gorgeous scenery but you know what great to look at great to experience but not necessarily great to take a picture of unless you've got something right in the middle of it something to give you a focus something for your viewer to look at a bit like we had with the school which by the way is one of the great public schools of England that was Bryanston school onwards and upwards Look at that awesome Series 1 Land Rover. I love stuff like that. Especially when it hasn't been all done up and restored and shiny. Now where are we? I don't know. Let's go that way. pretty through there with that mist. Look at that. And that house. Can you see through the trees there? If I stop here, you might just see there's a branch in the way a little bit. But over there, we've got a gorgeous house. And I love all this mist going on down here in the valley. Okay, there's a little car park lay-by back there. I'm going to spin around and pick it up from over there. So let's go take a look and see if we've got a better view. It's kind of muddy. But hey, this is what it's all about, isn't it? I know the house is almost invisible to you down there in the valley at the moment because you've got a very wide angle lens. You see with the tree on the left, that one, and the tree on the right, and that bit of mist up above the house, I think it looks really cool. 500th of a second at f8, 200 ISO is just a fraction bright. No, it isn't actually, it's about right. So got our composition, we know what it needs to be. I'm just tweaking my focal length, focus on the house. Let's have a look. 
I do rather like that. We've got detail in that mist, beautiful light on the house. I love the trees. It's nestled in the valley. I think that is cool. I'm not even going to bother taking another one. I think that might look kind of nice with these trees in the foreground. There's that little house up on the top of the hill. Now, I'm not going to roll video to show it. I just like these trees running up through the valley there. And you see there's that little house in that misty area up in the distance. Isn't that pretty? I notice there's a little bit of brightness in the top right hand corner. I've just got a bit of sky and I don't like that. So how do we cure it? Really simple, isn't it? Focal length, composition, they are best mates. So let's just focus over there again. Sneak in a couple of millimetres more focal length. Make sure we've got the trees and all that. No sky and do it again. There, that's better, isn't it? Isn't that pretty? By the way, this place is called Hanford House. It was built in the 1620s by a chap called Robert Seymour, who was knighted shortly thereafter. Whether it was for building the house or not, I have no idea. Today it's a school, Hanford School, one of the great private schools of England. Another little bit of history for you. We're just coming down into the beautiful little old village of Child Oakford. There has been a settlement here, or a village here, since the time of the Doomsday Book, and it goes back even, even further into prehistory when there were Neolithic sites and stuff. Many of the old buildings are original, many, many hundreds of years old, and they are still inhabited. Let's just have a quick whiz up the village. I want to go down there. I just want to see just how old some of these buildings look. So far, not massively so. I love this mist just kind of sitting in the air. It's gorgeous. This is what I mean when I say, isn't it a wonderful, beautiful world we live in? I reckon they're pretty old. They've been there a little while, I reckon. Well, certainly the middle part had. The Baker Arms pub. I bet that place could tell some stories. But yeah, mist in the air, all these things. It's just, you know, wonderful. It's so easy when we're caught up in our day-to-day -day lives of being peed off about something or other that actually it's a pretty special place we live. Well, I can't see any incredible, beautiful old houses at the moment. I'm probably going through the wrong part. That looks a bit more interesting. Anyway, enough of this dribble. reach our destination. <laughs> are you off your head, Brown? What are you doing bringing us into an, in a, into an industrial estate? Don't you think that has probably got some possibilities? Shillingston Station. It was closed down oh, a long time ago, in the 1960s. It used to be a branch line. But I'm not really a rail buff or a train buff but nonetheless it's an interesting place it's a little bit of history and also I kind of like the fact we've still got this mistiness just laying down here in the valley I think this could be fun give us a shake when you you're ready yeah actually I like this bit of mistiness it gives the old yeah it does yeah it kind of gives the place a little bit more with an air of mystery, doesn't yeah. it? Oh, that is nice. You know? It's a big enough mystery. Why the hell are you doing this every time? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, well, pictures with a bit of mystery, I always think that it gives it a bit more... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's when it's like this, you quite often get a band of fog. It clears the fields. Yeah. 
and it clears the top and you get a streak right the way across Hambledon. It looks quite weird. Lovely. I just took a picture down at Hanford School, yeah. looking across there with the mist and the trees. Mm. Absolutely beautiful. Well, when I got here about 20 past 10, I could just about see the bush. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't see a damn thing. Brilliant. This is a great scene, isn't it? We've got the loco, we've got the sky. I love that sky. We've got gentle shade going on underneath the front of the station. So what sort of focal length? I've only got the 10 to 24, and I'm probably going to stick with that, to be honest with you. Let's have a look through here. Now, look, if I shoot this from here, look, it's nice enough. What have I got my lens set on? It is set on 18, 19 millimetres. It's OK. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? But watch what happens if I change the focal length, if we make it wider and move our body. Look. As I zoom this and walk forwards, look what's happening to the shot. Now I've got to be careful I don't fall off the edge of the platform. So I want to get over here somewhere. Look, that is far more dynamic in my opinion. So I'm going to set 125th of a second F8, 200 ISO. The camera's telling me it's a sneeze overexposed, but that's cool because we want to be able to see under the platform. How does that look? <laughs> Get in. What happens if I re-extend the focal length to where it was? It was about 19, 18 millimetres. Let's come back and see if we can do the same composition from back here. Now, I'm not going to say one is right and one is wrong, but I am going to say they're different. Do I need to change exposure? Of course not. Nothing's changed. The light hasn't changed. Manual exposure is so much faster. It's just a different look. I prefer the wider angle shot, the distortion that goes with it. I like the way we've got the railway track hard in the foreground. We're just sort of looking further down along this edge of the platform than we are when we use the slightly longer 19 millimetres, which is cool. By the way, everything I'm going to talk about now have talked about earlier. It's all covered in my Masterclass in Photography online course. Go and check it out if you're a little bit confused by this. If you want to make the best of your trips out into the countryside, on your bike, in your car, on your bicycle, whatever it may be, on your horse, you've got to learn how to make that thing do your bidding because it doesn't take pictures. You do. Come and check it out. Link, top right of your screen. Go and have a look. Find out how I can help you. Look, I have many thousands of others. Let's move on. Let's take another shot somewhere else. But before we do, I just had a thought. If you haven't got a wide enough angle lens, and also, let's face it, you might be out exploring. You may not want to take your camera and a couple of different lenses. Maybe you're out, you haven't got it, but you've almost always got one of these bad boys in your pocket, haven't you? And most of these things will shoot panoramics. If you put it onto the pano setting, you can then get a really great look with your phone. I start recording, now look, I'm panning to the right. I'm moving my phone to the right until I get to the edge of what I want the composition to be, which is that tree. And suddenly I've got that shot. Let's compare that one to what I did with the camera. In some ways, I actually prefer the one taken on the phone. This is one of those really annoying things, but you've still got to understand light and composition and where to stand. Why am I standing here? Because it would look a lot more boring if I stood right opposite the platform. Let's go and find another one. I must do a video just using a phone at some point, mustn't I? Now this one is a little bit more tricky. Think about the exposures we've used here so far. Have we needed to change them? No, because if you're shooting in manual mode, once you've set the exposure, if the light doesn't change, that job of work's done. You can forget about it. You can get all creative. You can start looking for pictures and things that look interesting. Now, I think this looks interesting from here. I've still got exactly the same exposure set on my camera I've been using all the time. Let me put a video on. I'm still using 10mm lens. I quite like this. I like the, the signal here, the railway uh, train there, and I like the welcome sign, and I like these rails. Look at this bit of light, which is catching this rail in the foreground. It's giving us some depth. I can't do anything about that little blob of lens flare, but I do kind of like lens flare. I don't have a problem with it. So let's take this shot at the exposure the camera says, and the one we've been using all morning, and it won't be far wrong. Let's have a look at it. 
Of course the sun has burnt out, there's haziness in the sky, but I don't mind that because that's just kind of how the world works. And if I look at it with my eyes, that sun is burnt out, trust me. I'm not going to really know until I get home, but I can look at the histogram, learn to read your histogram, eyes lie, histograms don't, and it tells me that it's going to be okay. Right now my screen looks really, really dark. In the back here, why? I've just been looking towards the sun. What have my pupils done? They've got really, really small. Has my LCD got brighter to compensate for the fact I'm outside in daylight? No. So the screen looks terribly, terribly dark. These are all things you need to think about. One of the reasons histograms are so important. Go and have a look at my masterclass. I'll explain it properly in there. So how about getting in a little bit close and intimate with this shunting engine here? Look, if I go with a longer lens and stand back really close to you, it's okay, isn't it? But it's, it kind of loses any feeling of intimacy. It's not a bad shot, but it ain't great. It could also do with being a bit brighter, couldn't it? Let me see if I can brighten it up so you can see what's happening a bit better. There we go. But if we make that lens shorter and move closer, look, we've now got that distortion. It's causing a sense of intimacy. Now there's two ways you could do this. I quite like the train in the middle and I quite like this up the top here, the scallops from the platform, what's going on down there. But also you noticed right on the right hand corner over here, I like that lamppost too. It just sort of holds it all together. Now the sky is incredibly bright in this, but that's because the video can't quite capture the same dynamic range as the, sorry guys, carry on. <laughs> I'm blocking everybody. <laughs> Thanks guys. It doesn't have the same sort of dynamic range as the still. So let's take our picture again. Do we need to change the exposure? No because the light hasn't changed. We've got sunlight and shade. I'm looking at the histogram. It says everything is peachy dandy. So let's just take this one here, make sure everything's straight. I rather like that. You see how it's distorted the engine just a little bit, but I still think it's a really interesting shot. It's got that intimacy going on in there. Always look all around the viewfinder of your camera or your phone or whatever it is you're using to take a picture of because look from up here it looks kind of nice doesn't it but this railing it's all a bit strong isn't it I like the tree in the corner that's really nice that'd be very easy just to go oh I want to get a picture of the tree sorry the train and the hill well that's all right but that is a nicer composition, but this is just too strong, isn't it? Particularly with the highlight on it. So what if we move? Well, always look around, always think, where do you need to be in space and time in order to make something work? Doesn't that look better? Let's just brighten this up just a bit if I can. There we go, you can see more. And look, we've got that lovely cloud going on in the sky. We've got the tree in the corner of the frame. Putting things in the corner, look, corner, corner it just kind of works shame about the high-vis jacket hopefully it will be gone in a moment so how do we do what do we do how do we do what do we do we just flick it into camera mode check the light meter check the histogram everything is still peachy dandy where am i going to focus i've got a wide angle lens on nothing is close to the lens it's all beyond infinity therefore it's not a problem it's a row of dominoes isn't it let's just focus on the train just for the hell of it Frame it up nice and straight. Trees in the corner, train, hill, sky. Boom. <laughs> I hope you found some of these little tips useful. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to ping that notification bell so you never miss a video. And if you'd like me to make more of these videos, let me just draw your attention to the thanks button. It's kind of like Patreon but it's just here on YouTube. Be well, take care, and I look forward to seeing you next time. I'm sitting here with Jeff. He's one of the trustees, and we are inside a 1959 Hudswell Clark shunting engine. Is that correct? That is correct. Brilliant. Well, when did Shillington Station open, Jeff? 1863. Wow. And it went through till 1966 when it fell victim to the beaching axe. Yeah, when all the little branch lines were closed. Mm -hmm. Well, this wasn't a branch line. This was a, a main through route from Bath and Burnham-on-Sea down to 
Bournemouth West and Poole. Oh wow, this eighty is, odd miles. It was quite a mainline station in that case. In it those was days, a very important line in its day. Um, we had the Daily Pines Express each way, uh, going up to Manchester. That was the prestigious um, unit. During the summer months, dozens and dozens of holiday excursions. There was a lot of coal from the Somerset levels went down to Poole. Wow. Uh, during both world wars, enormous amounts of equipment heading down to the south coast for transfer to France. It's a real little piece of history, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely Very historic. It the, is. whole, the whole place is surrounded by history. Yeah, know. yeah, I know. The hill you know, behind the hills. Oliver Cromwell and Vespasian and, and Romans. Oh, I'd love to go into it. Rupert but, uh, Brooke. Um, yeah. You know, you name it. It's happened here, more or less. So how does this place su support itself? Donations, um, membership fees, cafe and the shop provide a lot of income. It's a uh, good shop too. Yeah. Pasties are awesome, as is the cakes and everything else. <laughs> yeah, and we, up until the dreaded Lurgy hit, we've been uh, trying to run an event every month of various sorts, like Easter Egg Hunt, Father Christmas. Uh, we have an amateur radio group uh, go up in the signal box and talk to other amateur radios at uh, other stations, and of course the public can go and have a try. Yeah, um, that's fantastic. And I mean, this baby runs and goes. Yeah, and yeah. I'm going to be starting her up in a short while, hopefully. Oh, are yeah. Well, if I'm still here, I'll see if I can just record a little bit of rattly, splendid-sounding, <laughs> big caliber diesel. Yeah. Okay. Well, look. I'm going to put a link in the description below. Come and click it. Have a look. Find out. And if you want to support Jeff and the great work they're doing, preserving a little bit of history, then yeah. go and have a look. Cause yeah. We're and always looking for more volunteers. Uh, don't have to commit yourself to hundreds of hours a week. You know, a couple of hours once a month is perfectly acceptable. There no, you go. all skills and none. Yeah. So if you've got an interest, it's yeah. a great cause. It's something you can do. Keep yeah. yourself out of mischief as well. Oh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate You're having welcome. a brief chat with you, mate. Yeah, Cheers. No problem.